Have you ever felt completely overwhelmed by a storm? I'm talking walls of rain, streets turning into rivers, homes underwater. That's the kind of devastation that just hit Turkey. Istanbul and the Black Sea provinces had faced a powerful onslaught of wind and rain, especially along the coast. In the city of Karadeniz Aragli, the center is completely flooded, streets are impassable, and the waves are crashing down, destroying everything in their path. Fallen trees are blocking the roads, and there are reports of hundreds of floods all across Istanbul, homes, workplaces. Everywhere you look is being battered by this terrible storm. People are calling in from all the towns around the Black Sea, reporting damage and chaos. Buildings are crumbling, cars are getting crushed under falling debris. This recent flooding has been a huge test for many people. In the Black Sea region, schools across Bolu and Zonguldak had to close, and some areas in Duce and Sakarya even shut down their elementary schools to keep everyone safe. The whole situation is terrifying. In the midst of this devastation, there was a frightening moment in Zonguldak province. A huge ship was split in two by giant waves. But here's the amazing part. Thanks to the quick and brave work of emergency responders, all 13 crew members were rescued. This incredible act of heroism shows the incredible love and compassion people can have for each other, even in the face of disaster. It's a reminder that we're all part of something bigger, and that even in the darkest times, there's always hope and the chance to help others. Even when things are tough, people come together to help each other. It's like a community showing the love of God. We see this amazing teamwork during disasters, and it's a reminder that God is always with us, even in the toughest times. But it must be said again and again, sadly, these strong storms are becoming more common because of our earth changing. Storms, floods, earthquakes. They remind us of God's immense power and majesty. Just like the beauty of Persian Gulf reflects his creation, these powerful weather events can leave us speechless. Even in the midst of challenges, we can find moments of wonder and appreciation for God's design. We need to take care of our planet, just like God asks us to care for each other. The recent storm reminds us of God's immense power over nature. While the cause is beyond our immediate understanding, these events can lead us to contemplate God's majesty. The Bible tells us God is both a loving God and a just God. He desires a relationship with us, but sin separates us from Him. Perhaps the most serious aspect of sin is that it is the only thing that separates us from God. Because God is holy, sin cannot dwell in His presence. Thus, it is the reason why it separates us from Him. Romans 8 talks about what can separate us from the love of God. The argument Paul was making is that there is nothing and no one that could ever separate us from God's love. Nothing that happens to us or is done to us will ever keep us from God's love. However, while nothing outside of us can separate us from God's love, the choices we make can. Meaning that if we choose to live in sin and continue in sin, we will ultimately be separated from God's love. Remember. God is holy. My friends, God's not playing around in the Old Testament. His anger towards sin isn't some random outburst. It's a holy response to evil. Take, for example, Exodus 22, 24. God tells Israel, Don't mistreat foreigners living among you, because if you do, I will hear their cries, and my anger will burn. You'll be killed, your wives widowed, and your kids left with no father. This verse shows how seriously God takes sin. Remember Adam and Eve? God warned them, eat that fruit and you die. Genesis 2, 4 and 17. Death entered the world because of Adam's sin and sin has always triggered God's righteous anger. Even before the word wrath is used in the Bible, we see it in action. Death itself is God's consequence for sin, as Romans 5, 12, 21 tells us. Let's face it, life is short. It's a consequence of God's wrath against sin that hangs over all of us. Every graveyard is a constant reminder. Sin separates us from God and leads to death. That's why we need a savior. The good news is, there's an escape. In the Old Testament, we see glimpses of God's anger towards sin. Remember Adam and Eve getting kicked out of Eden? Genesis 3. Or the Great Flood? Genesis 6, 9. These are all examples of God's holiness. He can't tolerate sin forever but he's also merciful. So why did God flood the world? The story of Noah and the flood is one that many of us grew up hearing about in Sunday school. But even those who did not have any religious education growing up have likely heard about the story of the flood. It is probably one of the best known stories in the Bible, although not well understood. 
and it is also one of the more controversial. Was this an actual worldwide event, a more localized event, or simply a mythic story? Answering that question is beyond the scope of this article. But I do want to look at the purpose of this flood. Why did God choose to destroy the world of Noah's day in a cataclysmic flood? The Story of the Flood The story of the flood is told in Genesis chapters 6 through 9. This passage starts with a strange description of the sons of God and daughters of men seemingly producing the Nephilim. Mixed in with this is God's response to the wickedness of the world and his determination to destroy it all. Following this was God's instruction to Noah to build a large boat and take on board pairs of all the animals. God was going to be sending a massive flood that would destroy all terrestrial life not on board the ark. So, Noah built the boat and loaded the animals that God brought to him. No sooner was this done than the rain began, and the springs erupted. It rained for forty days, and the ground was flooded for over a year. Finally, the water subsided enough for everyone to come out of the ark. Noah offered a sacrifice, and God responded by committing himself to never again destroy the earth by flood. Why did God save Noah and his family? A consistent theme woven throughout history is God's perfect justice, not only in faithfully punishing sin, but also in faithfully rescuing the few who trust in him. When the Lord rained burning sulfur on Sodom, a city full of arrogant, greedy women and men eager to rape anyone they could get their hands on, he spared a believer named Lot. When Lot hesitated to leave, angels grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and daughters and led them to safety, for the Lord was merciful to them. Genesis 19, 1, 16, Ezekiel 16, 49. Among all the quarreling, backstabbing, greedy humans, Noah must have stood out like a sore thumb. Genesis 6, 8, 9 says he was a good man who had a good relationship with God. In his mercy, the Lord chose to spare Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. He did so not because Noah and his family were perfect, but because they believed him. Noah built the ark because he believed that God really would bring the flood and really would save him. Hebrews 11.7 Ruling out one alternative. Genesis 6.6 6 says that, The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. And, in response, God determined to destroy all life on the earth. It would be easy to read this and see a God who was caught off guard by how sinful humanity had become. A God who became so angry that he decided to wipe out the whole mess and start over again. But it is hard to reconcile that with a God who is omniscient, who knows the future. A God who had chosen Christ as our atoning sacrifice before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1.20. And who had chosen me in Christ at the same time, Ephesians 1.24. The word translated as regretted in Genesis 6, 6 could also be translated as be grieved. And that seems to me to better fit here. This is an emotional response from the creator over what his creation has become. Even though he knew it would come to this, it was still distressing to him. God is not an impersonal force or entity with no feelings for his creation. Rather, he is intimately involved with his creation. We see him expressing delight in what he has done and disappointment in what we have done with his creation. The obvious alternative. The most obvious answer to the question of why God flooded the world is the one given twice in the first few verses. Genesis 6, 5, 7 tells us that the Lord saw how wicked humanity had become, that every inclination of our hearts was to do evil, and he determined to wipe us from the face of the earth. Genesis 6, 11, 13 says essentially the same thing, going on to give instructions to Noah about saving a remnant of life on earth. I suspect that the charge, that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time, was hyperbolic. But it clearly describes a condition of extreme rebellion against God. Even as bad as we think our world is today, it does not approach the condition described here. Most people, even though in rebellion against God, are at least living decent lives. So, it would seem like humanity had reached a point where, if God had not intervened, they would likely have destroyed themselves. And so God stepped in and put an end to the wickedness of those days. A less obvious alternative. Genesis 6 1-4 is a very puzzling passage, and one that we often just scratch our heads over and go on. But I do not believe it is just an incidental story that the author of Genesis decided to include just to fill up the scroll. I do believe that it is applicable to what follows and that it provides additional information concerning God's decision to destroy the world. In these first four verses, there are three specific groups mentioned, 
the sons of God, the daughters of humans, and the Nephilim. Who are these three groups? One common response is to identify the sons of God as the descendants of Seth, and those who call on the name of the Lord, Jenner 4 to 26. The daughters of humans would then be the descendants of Cain, and the Nephilim would simply be their offspring. But, I believe a more likely explanation identifies the sons of God as being the same group mentioned in Job 1.6 and Job 2.1. In Job, the NIV translates sons of God as angels. But it is the same expression as used in Genesis 6.1.4. That would mean this passage then describes a sexual union between angels and humans. And their offspring were the Nephilim. The sixth and seventh chapters of the non-canonical book of 1st Enoch describes just this scenario. A group of angels called Watchers determined to have children by human women. These children were described as giants who preyed on humans, and the Watchers taught humans things that they were not supposed to know. It would be easy to dismiss this account as mere fantasy. Yet Jude 1, 6 and 2 Peter 2, 4 both seem to draw from 1st Enoch as they describe the punishment given to fallen angels. And, since Jude and Peter seem to take this account seriously, I think we should not entirely dismiss what this account records. This less obvious alternative to why God sent the flood is not really an alternative. Rather, it provides additional information leading to God's decision. At least a part of the reason for the rampant human wickedness had to do with the fall of this group of angels and their influence on humanity. God sent a flood to cleanse the physical earth, and he bound the fallen angels in chains awaiting a future judgment. Serving as an example. One final thought as to why God flooded the earth comes from 2 Peter 2, 4-6 and 1 Corinthians 10, 1-11. These passages both look at historical events described in the scripture. These were times when God had punished the sinful activities of humanity, and both passages describe this punishment as being an example to us. The 2 Peter reference specifically identifies the fallen angels and the flood of Noah's days as being an example of what will happen to the ungodly. Clearly, God does not immediately execute judgment and punishment on every transgression of humanity. But He has given us plenty of examples of what will happen to sinful humanity. Our punishment may be delayed, but it is just as certain as the flood. I believe that the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16, 19, 31 speaks to this as well. At the end of the parable, the rich man pled for Lazarus to be sent back to warn his brothers. Abraham responded by saying that they have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Today, we still have Moses and the prophets to warn us of the consequences of our sinful actions. In addition, we now have the New Testament as well. An example of this warning in the New Testament comes from Acts 5 1 11. Ananias and Sapphira lied to God concerning what they sold their property for, and it cost them their lives. This did not happen in the future, but immediately. This action on God's part is not repeated that we know of. Yet we have the example of Ananias and Sapphira to warn us about the seriousness of lying to the Holy Spirit. Why the flood? I believe we can find two distinct reasons for the flood. The first, and most obvious reason, is because of the sinfulness of humanity. A sinfulness that seemed to have reached an all-time peak, potentially aided by a group of fallen angels. A second and more significant reason for the flood is the example that it provides for us. God takes the sinfulness of humanity seriously. Even though the flood was a one-time event, it does remind us that judgment awaits those who persist in living in rebellion against our Creator. And what about the Ark of Noah? When we picture Noah's Ark, we often think of the nursery decor version. A tiny, round boat bobbing along with giraffe heads poking out the top. God's blueprints for the ark, laid out in Genesis 6, 14, 16, describe something a bit different. The Lord told Noah to build a three-story wooden ark with rooms inside and to coat it with pitch. The Hebrew word we translate as ark means a box or storage chest. Pitch is a black, sticky waterproofing material that can be made from pine trees. The ark sounds more like a black barge than a tan teacup. The dimensions are staggering, 450 ft long. 1 1 to 2 football fields, 75 ft wide, and 45 ft high. For comparison, the title of world's tallest giraffe is currently held by Forrest, who stands at 18 feet, 8 inches. This boat covered over 3 4 of an acre. God also told Noah to store on the ark portions of every kind of food, enough for his family and two of each kind of animal. He made clear that the only way to survive the coming flood was to be on the ark. 
Noah got to work and followed God's instructions to the letter, Genesis 6, 17 and 22. When the ark was completed and all were aboard, God shut them in. That very day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. It rained for 40 days straight. Floodwaters covered the peaks of the highest mountains for seven one two months. Over a year after Noah boarded the ark, the waters finally went down enough for him to step out onto dry land. He built an altar in worship to the God who had saved him, and the Lord promised never again to destroy the earth with water. Genesis 7, 1, 9, 17. What does this story teach us about God? First of all, God is kind. Have you ever felt lost and confused? Imagine Noah. God told him to build a giant boat, but how big should it be? What about all the animals? Could you handle a surprise parade of elephants and lions? God didn't leave Noah hanging. He gave Noah clear instructions, just like he gives us guidance in the Bible. It's like a loving father giving his child a plan. Even better, God told Noah exactly when the rain would start and stop. No more worrying if it would ever end. That's amazing grace, right? And after the storm, God gave a beautiful rainbow as a symbol of his promise. Never again would he flood the earth. It's like a colorful reminder that even when things seem scary, God keeps his promises. He loves us that much. Secondly, God is all-powerful. Imagine a world spinning out of control. People are caught up in their daily routines, oblivious to the coming storm. That's what happened before the flood. But God, unlike the weather, is never unpredictable. The Bible tells us, mention verses, e.g., Mark 4, 35, 41, that God controls everything, even the wildest storms. He waited patiently for Noah to build the ark, just like he waits patiently for us to come to him, mention verse, e.g., 1 Peter 3:20. The flood waters cleanse the world, but the Bible tells us something even more powerful can wash away our sin, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Mention verse, e.g., 1 Peter 3.21. Just like Noah was safe in the ark, we can be safe from God's judgment by accepting Jesus. <coughs> the story of Noah is a warning that God will judge the world again, just like he promised. Mention verse, e.g., 2 Peter 3.3.15. No one knows the exact day, but the Bible tells us to be prepared. Mention verse, e.g., Matthew 24, 36, 44. Finally, God is faithful to save. God not only promised justice in the form of fiery worldwide judgment, but he also built an ark. He invites all who would be saved to come aboard. The breathtaking part is that he loved you so much, was so determined to rescue you, that he sent his own son to take your punishment so you can live. Jesus offers himself as your ark. When he walked the earth, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. He said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. John 10, 9. If we refuse to get on the ark, as did the scoffers of Noah's day, we have chosen death. John 3, 17 to 18. But if we are safe in the arms of Jesus, we can say with the psalmist, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Psalm 32, 5, verse 7. The door stands open. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, verse 7. God points to Noah as an example of a man of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. What is faith? Hebrews 11-1 tells us, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is letting go of all attempts to be good enough, to measure up, to build your own ark, Faith gives you eyes to see that all the good deeds you've nailed together can't save you any more than a ladder or tower could have saved Noah from the flood. Faith trusts God that His way, His ark, will hold you safe. If you struggle to believe in a God you cannot see, you are not alone. Living in bodies of flesh and walking in a physical world, we all strain to grasp the spiritual. Pray with the man who stood face to face with Jesus and still cried, 
I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Mark 9 24. The essence of faith is throwing yourself on Jesus' mercy and admitting that you can't hack it on your own. Acknowledge that you do not have the faith or the goodness or the power to make yourself right with God, to wash away the shame of your sin. Beg Him to help you. And know that He will. Matthew 7 7 8 and 1 John 1 9 and 1 John 1 9 and 1 John 1 9.